Nitro number 155, August 31st, 1998, because it was on Monday. NWO Hollywood comes out for a promo. Oh, I remember what I was going to say. I was going to say something before we started the song. Then I forgot to deliver. That Raw show was on Saturday. Right? Yeah. Okay. That means this fucking Nitro was unopposed. Yes. They had the opportunity to show all of those viewers that tune in Monday nights who had been watching Raw but had nothing on Monday. They had the opportunity to show them the best of WCW. Maybe they could convert some of those Raw viewers into Nitro viewers if they put on a great show. This is what they presented the people. And by the way, by the way, there were segments on this show that set all-time cable viewership records. Because the show was unopposed. Let's talk about what they gave these people. NWO Hollywood comes out for a promo because, of course, they did. Bischoff again said his pen was the most powerful weapon in the world. Promised Eddie Guerrero would wrestle tonight and Warrior would not. Hogan then announces his partners for the War Games match. That's right. There's a War Games match coming up. There are three teams, and each of the teams has three men. Yeah. For example, the WCW team is the Warrior, who they kept calling the Ultimate Warrior, which got bleeped out live, but not on the network. The Ultimate Warrior, Diamond, Dallas Page, and Rowdy Roddy Piper. Who were Hulk Hogan's partners, Vinny, in the War Games? Well, he goes through, talks about how he's got all his friends in the NWO, black and white, all his NWO, NWO whites. He picks Bret Hart to be one of his partners. And then out of the whole roster, and off the top of my head, I just started writing names down. Not the Giant. Not any of the Scots. Not Hall, Norton, or Steiner. Not Kurt Hennig. Not even Buff Bagwell. Stevie Ray. Who wasn't even on the show. No. Where the fuck was Stevie Ray? Better things to do. Stevie, Stevie Ray. Ray. Stevie Ray. <laughs> Stevie Ray. I mean, I guess I needed somebody to do a job, but holy fuck. Are you kidding me? Hogan said Warrior was a coward who had been running for eight years. Called him to come out right now. Warrior obliged, and when this light show started and the smoke came out and this this guy stepped on a stage, I was 100% certain this was going to be Renegade in disguise. But no, it was actually Warrior. Who actually got a very big pop when he did his magic show. Yeah. So he comes down to the ring, and now the NWO has the ring surrounded. Hogan says, they're all here to see me crucify you. And Warrior says, speak to me, my warriors. The lights go out. The ring fills with smoke. And when the lights come back on and the smoke clears, Warrior is gone. And the Warrior signal is projected onto the ceiling. Yes. And everyone chanted for the guy. Sure. So, you know, I got to give him a little bit of credit. They figured out this fucking guy talking is death. And so, let's have him not talk and just show up and disappear. And lo and behold, it worked better. They didn't do everything wrong. Speaking of, it showed Goldberg doing an appearance with the St. Louis Cardinals and Mark McGuire. This is in the middle of McGuire chasing the home run record. He was pretty much the biggest thing in sports at the time, so this is a big deal. Wrath versus Jim Powers. The wrath push towards Kevin Nash killing him continues. Wrath had a great look. That's about it. He beat Powers up in a boring manner. He won with a pump handle power slam. This reminds me of the 1994 Royal Rumble that... Filthy Tom and I reviewed on last week's Filthy Four Daily, where Vince McMahon is doing commentary, and he's in the middle of steroid scandals and just everything else. He's beaten down. All of his guys are leaving. Sid's gone. Hogan's gone. It's just a disaster. Flair's gone. He's just all just, he's horrendous on the mic. He's doing commentary for this rumble. And number 30 is Adam Baum. And Vince McMahon with a straight face says, Adam Baum is going to win the Royal Rumble, which he fucking did not do. This goddamn match 
Is it that hard to open up Nitro with like an exciting cruiserweight battle to like get the people going and excited for the rest of the show? Or even a- an impressive dominant squash. This was oh. Wrath versus Jim Powers for like five fucking minutes. It uh-huh. was so boring. Yeah. It sucked. Correct. You're correct on all counts. Me and Gene and some of the Nitro girls were in Ohio for the latest Nitro party thing. They're at a high school gym. Mm -hmm. And they've got a bunch of high school players all outside salivating for the Nitro girls. And I'm like, this sounds like trouble. (laughs) Norman Smiley versus Scott Norton. Norton, another squash. A much better one, actually. Norton had the match won a few times, but kept pulling Norman up and finally hit a powerbomb and won. Another future Nash victim, I'm sure. He's building up all the monsters so he can beat them. The lights started to flicker and then went out. I can't see Diddley, Larry Zabisco complained. And then I think Warrior appeared on the rafters, although it was hard to see. A warrior did appear in the rafters. They have now decided that what will get him over is to make him sting last year. Mike Tanay did a pre-taped interview trying to talk to Lodi and Saturn. <laughs> oh, this was horrible. It was very, very bad. Like, God bless Saturn. But he's explaining he lost a match. And he's got to be Lodi's slave for a he, month. He agreed, per the steps of the match, that if he lost to Lodi, he would be Lodi's lackey. Okay. So Saturn explains, I am a man of honor and integrity, whether Raven is or not. I am a former army ranger. I live by a code. I will not be raped of my dignity. I tried so hard to just be as generic and boring as possible. I didn't even come close to... You blew him out of the water. Dasha would have blown this guy out of the water. This promo that he cut right here. You need to mumble more and uh, and, uh, uh, enunciate less, I guess. Be quieter. Yeah, it was terrible. It was a terrible promo by Perry Saturn here. It was so generic and monotone and lifeless. Where's Dasha been, by the way? She's vanished. I don't have an answer. Hey, you don't watch it? No. I don't see her either, so I don't know what happened. Wolfpack came out for a promo. Same shit they say every week. Can we talk about Lex's goatee? Lex in a beard does not work. (laughs) It's not even a beard. It's a goatee. He's got blonde hair and a black goatee that he's growing. Oh, that's one of the reasons it didn't work. It's fucking terrible. What was he thinking? (laughs) I don't know. He wrestled for 20 years, and I think he had his goatee for about three weeks or so here. So Nash is standing in the ring, and Luger is there, and Sting... I think Sting was there. Maybe not. They said Sting was on the way. Yeah. Lex Lex did say that. Yeah. But anyway, Conan's here as well. And Nash is talking about how we we have to have three guys for this match. But we've drawn straws. And so the three guys are Lex Luger, Sting, and Kevin Nash. <laughs> Shockingly, they didn't choose Conan. No. Yeah. Poor Hogan guy. chose Stevie Ray, but they did not put Conan in. So Nash begins to run down Team WCW. Warns Paige to pick a side. Says he's had run-ins with Roddy Piper in the ring and in the back. And then just starts to tell a story about four wolves eating a warrior. Basically, he was telling the warrior that if warrior didn't ride with the wolf pack, he would be hunted by it. I see. That's what he said. Tony Schiavone is in the ring to interview J.J. Dillon. When J.J. Dillon says, I want to have Arn Anderson come out here so we can have an off-the-record conversation. <laughs> an off-the-record conversation. <laughs> On live TV watched by millions. In front of million human beings. <laughs> in front of buildings surrounded by tens of thousands of people. So Arn comes out. and J.J. says, you know, I got a bunch of old tapes in my office. I found this old tape the other day. I want you to watch it. And what this was, was Arn Anderson's promo introducing himself to the Mid-Atlantic Wrestling TV audience in probably about 1982. Somewhere around there. He talks about this young fella named Arn who had a much deeper southern drawl than the Arn Anderson I know from the past 20 years. He talks about Gene and Ole Anderson running wild through the business, driving everyone out of the territory, and now the youngest, 
best looking Anderson of the Malls on the scene. Yeah, for once in his life, he cared about being good looking. He was the pretty boy. It was so unarned. He was prettier than Gene and Oli. Well, he was definitely prettier back then than Gene and Oli. Yeah. And he was prettier then than he was during the show as well. That's also true. So he runs down Dusty Rhodes and Ricky Steamboat, Magnum TA, and laughs and cackles. And honestly, it was a great promo. That's a very good promo. For they go back was... and Arn's like, where the hell did you find that? Yes. He wants to watch more of them. So JJ says this tape is at least 15 years old. 15 years ago, he had gone to bat for Arn to bring him into Mid-Atlantic and then to bring him into the Horsemen. He said, as long as the Horsemen were around, WCW would always be okay. What the hell? <laughs> the four Horsemen were always good company men? Well, to JJ they were. <laughs> you know what? That's a strong point. I thought of it that way. So they bring out Steve McMichael and Chris Benoit. Arn shakes their hands, and the three of them have a huddled conversation away from the mic. That actually was off the record. And then Arn walks away and starts to leave. Dylan runs him down and asks where he's going. Arn looks down at his crippled, withered left arm and asks JJ, why are you doing this to me? And JJ says, Arn, you're just afraid. And Arn hangs his head and walks away. You know, I got to say, this was a hell of a build to the return of Ric Flair. It was. Yeah. Which is coming up in two weeks, if I recall. Played in the literally 15 years of history. They replayed that awful Eddie Guerrero work shoot promo from two weeks ago. All right, here's the question. Was that fucking promo worse than this fucking match or what? Because I'm not sure. Oh, the promo was much worse. Oh, really? Then this match, this fucking Brian Adams, Eddie Guerrero match was so just, it killed the show. Ah, uh, well, kind of. Because, you see, Eddie Guerrero didn't want to wrestle. He was contractually obligated to wrestle. And uh, he was not, as you would later explain, he was not going to get sued like some people had. So he did the absolute bare minimum to fulfill his legal contractual obligation. He went to the ring. He laid down for a while. Adams would not pin him. He dared Adams to hit him. And he would cover up and defend himself, Eddie would, but he would never fire back. And this went on for a while. And finally, Adams got bored, as was everyone else, and Eddie was laying in the ring, and Adams put a foot in his chest and pinned him. Was this fun to watch? No. Did it make sense? Yes. Kind of. If you're contractually obligated to wrestle, and you go out there and do this, I mean, if I'm Bischoff, I file a lawsuit against the guy. You're not doing your job. How can you prove, beyond a shadow of a doubt, he was not giving his best? Uh, you show every other Eddie Guerrero match ever and then show this one? Oh, well, they are all better than that. That's a pretty shit. open and shut case right there. He appeared, the bell rang, he was present and accounted for. It's fucking sucked, Vinny. It was horrible. All I know is I've seen 200 matches where guys have been forced to wrestle, and I always think, why don't you just lay down and get pinned? Well, he tried. So he I did. guess you it, finally got what you wanted. I did. Even even Larry was like, you can just walk out and take a count at loss if you don't want to be here. I guess that would that would count as uh that would would be a breach of contract, but getting pinned would not be. Why? It was a count on the main event. That's not a breach of contract. You walked away. Know. The guy should go I, get you. I don't know. It sucked. Can we move on? Eddie was ranting about it in his promo and they cut his mic. They showed the cat laying out Disco Inferno on Thunder. Yeah, what the world was needing was an Ernest Miller heel turn. Who could possibly care? So Ernest's gimmick is that pro wrestlers suck. He knows karate, and he's a badass. He keeps saying, in this ring, there's one wrestler and one world karate champion. This led to Ernest Miller versus Riggs. This sucked. All Ernest did was kicks. Timing was off on all of them. One was supposed to be the finish, and it was so bad, like even as Cat's making the cover, everyone starts to boo. So Riggs kicks out. And Cat hits the kick again and wins this time. Cuts a promo saying he is a karate champion and nobody can stop him. You know, this is, you can add Ernest Miller to the list of guys that includes Steve Mongo McMichael, who are getting worse and worse every single time they get in the ring. Do you remember when Ernest Miller debuted? It was weird because I remember Ernest the Cat Miller being absolutely fucking terrible. And then I went back and we watched his debut and I was like, that's pretty good. That was pretty good. Well, the more experience he gets, the worse he is in the ring. I don't know how it's possible, but I know he's pulling it off. 
This was horrible. Back at the Nitro Party in Ohio, an anonymous football player revealed his NWO shirt underneath his football jersey. Another one said Wolfpack would win war games. And then there was the skinny dork there in Sting makeup. And Gene says, what's up with you? And the young man says, I am the Stinger, baby. And the kids, and uh, Gene says, sure you are. <laughs> I love Gene. <sighs> All right, you I'm ready? Not, I have not yet recovered from this match to discuss it. I may never be the same. Conan versus Marty Jannetty. Yeah. I don't know. We've talked about this before. Because... Whenever there is a team, and we all know these days teams don't last forever, they're going to break up soon, and everyone argues which guy in the team is Shawn Michaels and which is Marty Jannetty. And I have said for years this is unfair because Marty Jannetty was a really, really good pro wrestler, and it's not fair to compare him to Shawn Michaels, the best of all time. That said, it is 1998. Marty Jannetty is Marty Jannetty, a guy who can have a good match in the opener, lose, and move on with life. And that's all he's ever going to be from this point forward. Conan is not a tippy-top guy, but his, he's friends with the top guys. He's, he's been a member every- of the Wolf Pack. He's a, he's a main, well, he's not a main eventer, but he's, he's a, he is he's a, a star. top guy. He's a he star. Is a, he is a star. He is on this show every week, winning every week. Why did I have to watch Marty Jannetty beat up Conan for 10 minutes? In his hometown! This is in Miami! So, I was wondering why I had to watch this in 1998. And then by the end, I was like, this match began... This match was in 1998, but it began in 97 and ended in 99. It just went on and on and on it was never any good. Did you get the actual time? Nine minutes and seven seconds, bell to bell. It was nine minutes and seven seconds. I swear to God, if you watch this match, it was an hour long. It went on forever. It was so boring. The fans were chanting boring. Conan did nothing but sell, and he was completely blown up. You said it, it felt like an hour watching it. It felt like three hours for him resting it. He was gone. Marty hit 1,000 moves in a row, I'm sure. And then Conan hit a kick, a horrible X factor because he was all blown up, and through great difficulty, I mean, he could barely stand at this point, he hooked the Tequila Sunrise for the win. I went minus two and a half stars, and I think I was generous. I think this is worse than that. I don't know if I'd go that far, but it is. it was inconceivable to me that Marty Jannetty could have a match this boring. But he did! It is horrible. The show is dying this. at this point. I cannot give this a strong enough recommendation if you do not watch this program. And then. Oh, my God. Okay. All right. We have been talking about this fucking Raven Saturn Canyon feud for a while. And in hindsight, it's clear to me that this is actually a worse storyline than Taker and Kane and Cahoots. Oh, yeah. It, it just, just doesn't, doesn't get as much attention. It doesn't matter because it's lower on the card. Yes. But it's worse. Well, it's worse so, in a lot of ways because, like, stuff is apparently happening on Thunder and in the pay-per-views, but they're not bothering to tell us about it on Nitro. So we've been watching this goddamn program, and all of a sudden this week, Canyon comes out with Raven and mm-hmm. Saturn and Lodi, and now Canyon is apparently with Raven, and he's a heel. Canyon and Raven are buddies now. Just magically. Saturn has forced a team with him. At least they explained that part. I feel the need to just read some of my notes verbatim here. Raven told Lodi to tell Saturn not to touch Raven and Canyon. Lodi told Saturn not to touch Raven or Canyon. Raven told Canyon to break Saturn. Canyon cut a promo making fun of Saturn's pride and integrity, daring him to hit him, Saturn wouldn't do it. Raven said he had to team with Lodi now. Saturn was sad. I am astonished that you wrote that many words for that opening segment right there. 
So then they actually do a match. It is Saturn and Lodi against High Voltage. Fuck you. The first three words I wrote were, this show sucks. I wrote, I wrote, oh, fuck you. You know what? This is another one of those matches where it wasn't even that bad. It wasn't like it was a complete disaster in the ring. But it was Saturn working all by himself versus fucking High Voltage before a crowd that couldn't possibly have given a shit. They're getting more dead with each passing moment. Saturn hits a Death Valley driver. Lodi demands a tag. He gets the pin. It was unopposed. Can I repeat that again? There was no Raw on the other channel. And these fuckers sat down and wrote this goddamn show. Yeah, the second consecutive negative star match. Shivani brought DDP out for a promo. Paige says he has a great team in Piper and Warrior. He runs down Eric Bischoff and Hollywood Scum Hogan, which he thinks is just so clever. He brings out Piper. Well, I got a couple things to say before that. First off, he decides at the beginning of this to plug the Little League World Championships. And then he says, the, the Little League World Championships. How does he praise the winners of the Little League World Championships, Vinny? <laughs> I know what you're going to say. I forget his exact words, but I thought he the same thing. He says, and I quote, those boys jacked it out. That's right. I fucking fell out of my chair when I heard that. Was that was not the best choice of words. And then he's in the middle of plugging his team for war games. And somebody in the crowd, there's there's two guys. They've got a sign that says, Team WCW is taking down Hollywood. Now, that's a lot of words. Okay? That's six words. Team WCW is taking down Hollywood. So when I said it was a sign, it was actually two signs because it's so many words. And there's two guys holding these signs up next to each other. But the signs aren't glued or taped together. And so the first sign actually says, Team is down Holly. And the other, and the other sign says, <laughs> I swear to God, WCW taken wood. I didn't catch that. Oh, I fucking was dying. <laughs> I was doing anything to amuse myself here. <laughs> These guys thought they were so oh, clever. Oh, so out hands. comes Roddy Piper. He does his weekly horrible stand-up routine. He calls Hulk Hogan Baldy. Now, in the 80s, guys weren't allowed to call Hulk Hogan bald. That was you were it was a banned term. You could not call Hulk Hogan bald when you cut a promo on him. So now it's the 90s. They're in WCW. Piper is taking every opportunity to do so. Keep in mind, it still bothered Hulk Hogan. Even though he'd been bald for a decade, he actually filed a defamation of character lawsuit against Vince Russo over the 19... It was a 2000 bash of the beach where Russo cut the promo on him and the thing that made it wasn't the one thing, but one of the things that made Hogan so mad was Eric was Russo called him a big bald bastard. That was part of his lawsuit. He was still so angry about that in the year two thousand. Roddy's going on and on about how he's bald. Other other than that, I have no idea what he's rambling on about. He's trying to get Brett to do the right thing, get out of Hogan's ass. He he's he's talking about stories about Bret Hart from twenty years ago working for Stu and this young kid comes up to him and says they're related and I thought what what's happening so he's running down he's running down Brett and running down Brett and running down Brett and Giant runs down and Paige sees Giant coming and Paige and Giant are brawling in the ring 700 pounds of human being having a fight Piper's oblivious he just keeps on going. Well, you know, to be fair, I buy that. <laughs> I, I, sure? <laughs> just going to tell you. <laughs> sure? It's but not it, impossible that happens. It's still not a good thing. So eventually he realizes that's going on, and Giant destroys them both. 
and security comes out to stop him. They handcuff him. The crowd's chanting for Goldberg, and Giant just says, Bischoff will bail me out. I mean, what happened, everybody, is Giant ran down. He killed DDP and Piper like a bunch of geeks. That's what happened. And he's not in the war games. No, he's just a guy. <laughs> Stevie Ray is instead. Okay, it's been like three weeks now. Does this Scott Steiner and his fucking burnout doctor thing ever have a payoff or... You don't know, forget that. An end. Does it ever stop? Well, it does eventually stop. I know that. I am certain now that the Eric Bischoff Tonight Show skits were better than this fucking doctor. And any <laughs> jokes not, agree about this. It's not even so much the doctor, but it's the whole rigmarole with Bagwell coming out every week as just a different geek. Oh, well, let, me, let me say this. Dave buried Scott Steiner's promos, but you know what? He was never a great promo, but once he kind of figured it out, Big Papa Pump was an awesome character. And if you watch Steiner's promos like a month ago and you compare him today, he is getting better. It sucks that he's learning his job on national television. We have to watch it every week, but it is better and it does get better. But the goddamn doctor is death. Bagwell coming out. This week he was dressed as a Jamaican. He's doing voodoo to heal Scott Steiner. Fans are chanting bullshit. It's just the most horrendous segment. He heals Scott Steiner. It was just, it was awful. But I can't completely bury it because Steiner was improving. But it did suck on television here. So Rick comes out. He says, I'll kick Scott's ass on the 13th. The lights go out. Warrior is shown in the rafters again. This show is so bad. <laughs> this show was so bad. Well, funny you should mention that because next we had Hoovy versus Evan Courageous. Yeah. Evan Courageous had done like a thousand matches on WCW Saturday Night. He'd never been on Nitro before. So they bring him out here at the in the third hour of the most ungodly, horrible show. And they have him wrestle for like 10 minutes against Hoovy. And all he did was moves, 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 moves. Fans are trying to get girls to show their boobs. Some of the girls did. Yeah, you don't undersell that. The crowd at many, point, at many points throughout this match, they all turned their backs to the ring and looked to the right. And they're all chanting at a girl over there or something. Maybe a girl was egging them on. I thought it was a fight at first, but clearly by the end it was women. Then the, they still their backs to the ring, but they look to the other side of the building to see what's going on, going on over there. And there's cheers when girls will flash. And there's boos when I think they were being taken away because the crowd was chanting, let her go. Then they all cheered again because I guess the crowd broke or the girl broke free and flashed everyone again. And they were all happy. This is all going on. Eventually, even Bobby Heenan can't ignore this. But because the announcers are never smartened up, he assumed like someone was coming through the crowd. And he panics and says, what's everyone pointing at? Pointing at boobs, Bobby. Well, he probably watched this match and thought, surely somebody's going to run in and kill these two fuckers because they can't possibly keep wrestling. So eventually, the women stopped taking their clothes off. The crowd was forced to watch the match. They realized how boring it was. They let everyone know how boring it was. Went on and on and on. We had a chance of take it off. This pointless match just went forever. Heenan, who had been into this at first. In fact, Heenan said this Evan Courageous has a great body. He's going to be a big star someday. Can't win them all. By the end, he is furious about how these guys are refusing to go for pins. <laughs> oh, my God. He started out as an Evan Courageous fan, and by the end of this match, he is just bearing this guy. Yes. You've got to fucking go for covers, you idiot. Like, why do you keep just doing moves? He just, he's so <laughs> furious by the quote. end of this. Yeah. <laughs> so, Hoovy eventually wins with a Michinoku driver, and then through one of the more pissed-off victory celebrations you'll ever see, because he knew he just had a shitty match that nobody watched, and everyone hated it. We go back to the Nitro Party, where Mean Gene Oakland interviewed a high school phys ed coach. I guess it's better than most of the show. Maybe I shouldn't complain. Oh, my God. Disco Inferno versus Chris Jericho. Evan Courageous gets 10 minutes. Marty Jannetty gets 10 minutes. Disco and Jericho get three. And you know what's funny about it, too, is Jericho comes out and he starts doing this promo. And Tony Schiavone, God bless this guy. It's not his fault. But he fucking says, nothing ruins a night like Chris Jericho and a microphone. And I thought, this is the best fucking thing on this show so far. 
Like, I know that's your job to bury Jericho on the mic, but his interview and the following match was like the best four minutes of the entire show so far. Yes. And there wasn't even anything to it. It was a short match. Disco hit the chart buster. Jericho got his foot on the ropes and then put on the lion tamer for the submission. It was like, good. (laughs) I couldn't believe it. It was two and a quarter star. (laughs) Kevin Ash came out to do commentary for Goldberg's match. Coincidence or not, Goldberg's opponent was Al Green, Kevin Ash's old tag team partner. That's right, his first tag team partner, Al Green, getting a shot at the world heavyweight title for fuck only knows what reason. <laughs> so this crowd, as noted, for they had checked out like an hour ago. They were still in their seats, but they they hated the show. And then out came Bill Goldberg. When he finally hit this spear, I was frightened by the crowd reaction. <laughs> I was scared for the safety of the people in the building and the, 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 the stability of my computer. I thought I might melt down the white hot heat. And then he hit the jackhammer on one, and it was impossible not to think this. When Kevin Nash is out there, we all know what's coming. They fucking beat this guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it seems impossible. It is unimaginable. It's unthinkable. Vinny, but that's what happened. They beat him in four months. Yeah. <laughs> Not even a year from now. I don't even think it's that long. We'll no, see. it's December. Was it December? Okay, well, anyway. Oh, it's positive. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the end of this year. It. I knew, well, I thought it was like in November, but anyway. Yes, it boggles the mind. And you know what, too? <laughs> they, had a, they had a whole company of guys to feed to him. They could have done Goldberg Hogan, then do Goldberg, they could have done Goldberg Nash, then Goldberg Sting, then Goldberg Lex, then... Keep building up Raph. Do Goldberg Raph. I don't know, but there's a whole company to feed this guy and keep him going for years. There's 375 guys. Yes. Now, here's it, what's... Well, go ahead. No, that's, that's just also... Un, it, it, it's tragic. It really is tragic. Yeah, I've lived it many times. Now, here's the thing. This show, as I noted, like, it did great business and the rating was great. It hadn't hit him yet. These fans would buy their tickets to just see Goldberg kill Al Green. That's how over this guy was. This fucking show. Can you imagine buying a ticket for this show? Can you imagine? Well, no. I can't either. But people did. It was Starcade that he lost the title. Which, unless That's Starcade right, was in does. November, it would have been in uh, December. No, because somewhere in there, the, he does have a brief. They brought him Bam Bam Bigelow. Let's see. It was uh, uh, that was that's like a World War Three, I think. December twenty seven ninety eight, just like I thought. Yeah. All right. A much better main event, at least on paper, than we got on Raw. Hulk Hogan and Bret Hart versus Lex Luger and Sting. Well, the good news is they put in time and they had something resembling a finish. It was not an NWO run in. That's also true. With that said, god damn, it was boring. And the best part of this match actually was before it even started. Hogan and Brett come out. Sting and Luger come out. Tony Schiavone decides he's going to put over this Lex Luger. And he mentions Luger no longer champion. And he says the following words. I swear to God, this is a direct quote. Very short U.S. title reign for Luger, but still a great one. (laughs) Let me repeat that. Oh, God. Very short U.S. title reign for Luger. But still, a great one. Then he explains, he won it on Monday, he lost it on Thursday. That's great. Oh my god. This show's so terrible. So, one thing I noticed here, I've actually noticed it before. Sting, whether it was in singles or tags, when it was time for the comeback, he did not mess around. He'd do three or four punches, and then it was time for the stinger splashes. Just go right to it. So he goes for a stinger splash. Disciple pulls Hogan out of the way. Please, Hogan rem- please stop. Mm-hmm. He hits a stinger splash. He goes for a second one. And Disciple has one fucking spot oh, yeah. yes. in the entire match. All he has to do is pull Hulk Hogan out of the way of the second stinger splash. He forgets his only spot. Sting runs... He sees the Disciple is out of position. He stops running. 
he punches Hulk Hogan, and then he goes back and he goes to run again. You could not have made him look like a bigger geek, all because Disciple couldn't remember his only spot. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. There's too much going on. I forgot to write that down, but that all happened. So... So Sting is down after missing the Stinger Splash. Hogan removes his weight belt and begins to whip Sting with it. But Brett, who has been claiming that he and Sting are pals, he hits the ring, he yanks the belt out of Hogan's hands, throws it to the mat, and walks out in disgust. Hogan, of course, is not going to let himself get shown up by, like this by anyone. He stalks Brett down the aisleway. They bicker. They get counted out. Hey... At least it's a legitimate finish to a wrestling match. It was. It was. And it involved the people involved in the match and not 47 other guys. Yet. Because, you see, Hogan and Hart get back in the ring. They begin to shove each other. Smoke starts to fill the ring, but then stops. All the other geeks and the Hogan crew come out to separate them. Then the smoke starts again. The lights go out. When they come back on and the smoke clears, Warrior is in the ring beating his chest. Hogan is kneeling in the corner, facing away from the ring in terror. Everyone else is dead. He's poisoned the Warrior <laughs> There is a noxious smoke that fills the air <laughs> that only affects the heel wrestlers. Yes. It doesn't affect Warrior. Amazingly, it, Hogan. it didn't affect Hogan. No. Only the other geeks are affected. It's like geek smoke. Perhaps in the main event of uh, WrestleMania Six in Toronto, the two of them took some sort of uh, antidote. Or, Could have uh, been. Or uh, it is very possible. Immune something. Anyway, so <laughs> Hogan when it goes into total cartoon villain mode, and for what it was, it was actually very awesome and very funny. But his facials. As he's because he's hiding his face in the against the middle turnbuckle as he's kneeling in the corner, and when he peeks his eyeballs up and they're bugging out and his eyebrows are arched and he looks left and he looks right and then slowly turns and sees his army laying waist too, I laughed my ass off. It was really funny. I laughed my ass off when he ran up the aisle afterwards and and turned to look at the ring with his Hulk Hogan comedy eyes wide bugging out selling. He is a Bugs Bunny villain. He is. <laughs> okay, great. So, yes, Hogan runs for his life. The one guy in the show who was not trapped in the ring, I guess the, either show, is the, well, most of the guys on Raw who were trapped in the ring. But anyway, Hogan flees. He turns. He is in... He is... The, the orange man has turned white as a sheet somehow, and he's terrified, and he sees Warrior again. He runs backstage, and the show ends. This is also horrendous. I am fairly certain this was worse than Raw, although I could probably be convinced otherwise. It's hard to say. They were both they were both absolutely Just terrible. Dirt terrible. And you know what? I had somebody who sent in something and they said Rod does get better in late nineteen ninety nine. Well that's a year and a half away. I'm like, oh my god, I can't do this. It's so bad. And we all know Nitro's not getting better ever. No. So I mean, the good news about late 1999 is I think that it's around that time that Nitro goes back to two hours at least. That's one positive, but oh my god, another fucking year of this horrible shit? You guys better want, all appreciate this, because it's, it's shortening my life. I don't want to watch these shows. They're bad and hopeless. We must do our job, Vinny. All right. We've been tasked by the Lord to review these shows. The Lord, you say? <laughs> I don't know. All right, everybody, that's it. I'm pretty sure these shows are a sign there is no Lord. <laughs> or, <laughs> yes. Or, or he's dead, one of the two. Uh, let's move on. We're going to uh, wrap it up today, everybody. We'll be back on Thursday with NXT and Lucha Underground. We'll get back on the NXT train. Granny will join us for a short segment in which she will not be able to hear Vinny. That's always exciting. And all of the usual shows, the Filthy Four Daily, the Observer Radio, Observer Live, all of those are coming up tomorrow, so check those out. And if that is it all, we will talk to you again after a while. Good night.